Justin, I'm an alcoholic. And uh, it's it's an honor to be able to uh, speak in front of you guys this evening. And um, I was talking to my sponsor on the way over here, and it's it's funny, you know, something he says every single time he talks, and I always I always crack up. Is there are three pitches that you want to give, or three pitches that you think about giving? One's the one you plan to give. The other one's the one you actually give, and then there's one you're driving home and you wish you would have given that that pitch because you remember all the stuff that you really wanted to say, you know. Because you know, uh, everybody in here that's, that's done this knows how that goes. Um, I got sober uh, March 25th, 1996, down in Los Angeles, and uh, you know, for for a lot of people, you know, that are they're younger that get here, it's it's kind of a it was a bit intimidating when I was when I got here because I really didn't I was on that in that position where I didn't know if I truly belonged. I knew there was something wrong but I didn't know that I belonged in Alcoholics Anonymous because I was yeah, I was too young to have a problem. And that'll play in my story later on. Um, what I hope to share is my experience, strength and hope, what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Uh, and a lot's happened. Uh, it's a lot of life, you know. Um, I never you know I've heard it heard it said before in meetings not feeling comfortable in your own skin. I, I had a lot of that going on when I was a kid. I always felt kind of out of place on the outside. I always tried too hard to fit in or I always tried too hard to be a part of a group. And, and maybe that, you know, I, I don't have to figure out, thank God, that that was or didn't, did or did not contribute to where I ended up. But I know that when I started drinking, it was the first couple of times I never really got drunk, but it was when I would drink and I get that warm sensation when I was a kid and, and the, the grown-ups would leave and all the empty drinks were out and we'd, you know, start drinking. Yeah. Didn't, didn't necessarily get drunk, but I, I felt comfortable, more at ease. You know, it was a, it was a good sensation. I, I chased that for a long time. Um, my first real drunk, and I remember, you know, clearly it was a blackout. And, and that kind of set the stage for a lot of my drinking. And I just... If it was, if there was enough booze around, I drank till I blacked out. That was just my thing. I was that friend that, that you know, people were always kind of warning each other about. If I, if I showed up, chances are I was going to black out pretty quick, and just whatever happened happened. Huh. Could be some driving involved. It could be, you know, some some stuff got broke. I mean, you know, people didn't want you coming over if, if that was going to be your mo. And um, you know, high school parties seem harmless enough, but it's really not when you're driving with a load, you know, a load of your friends around, completely blacked out, um, which, which I did all the time. That was just kind of what I did in high school. Um, drinking was my thing. I, I, I messed around with other things, but I, I never stuck. It, it was always back to the alcohol. Um, could, you know, I could have could have thought it was something to do with my family, you know, my, my grandparents on both sides, my parents always warned me, you know, none of that stuff stuck, you know, my, my uncles were all drunks, I mean, everybody was kind of, kind of drunk, but it never really bothered me, it never entered into my, it factored in, because once I felt that, that ease and comfort, um, I never, it was just the last thing on my mind, I could care less, you know. Um, leading up to starting to drink every day, starting to mess around in, in, in sales while I was in high school. I got, you know, I thought it was kind of a cool path to go. Um, you know, I got, a, I got a request for the last time I spoke. Uh, I, I said I was, I was very, I thought, I, I thought of myself as a very influential white rapper, you know, just kind of a, you know, kind of a punk. And so, so obviously, you know, I thought I was a little ahead of my time, you know, I had a lot of, you know, earrings, nose ring, and I looked a lot different, and, you know, I acted a lot different. I thought maybe maybe some extracurricular sales might be cool. Well, it wasn't, you know. There, there are people, there are, it's a small town, there's, there's authorities, uh, there are people that notice that, and they don't really appreciate it. So, you know, kind of, it's funny, all those things that I, I, you know, was naturally good at when I was a kid, kind of fell by the wayside as, as my drinking progressed. And it, it happened pretty quick for me. Um, to the point where I sat down my, my senior year when I was actually at school, which was hardly ever. And I got sat down by the uh, principal of the school who said, we don't want your kind at our school. To me. And I was, I was shocked by that. It really blew me away that, that, <laughs> that 
you know, he would tell me this, like, what, what are you talking about? I'm like, you know, think maybe because you're from a, a family or a respectable family, you think maybe because, but it's not about that. It was about my actions. It was about what I was doing to, as who I was surrounding myself with, what I was doing on a daily basis. And I got sent away uh, to school, not a private school. It was, it was after I graduated high school, which I barely did. Um, once I was on the radar and I got told that, everyone else expected me to go every day. And uh, I barely graduated, not very well. I didn't learn much. And uh, I decided the best place would be to uh, go down to Los Angeles and go to, go to community college, you know, get out of that small town and, and get somewhere and, you know, fit in down there. And uh, that is kind of not what happened. I ended up moving down there and doing the same exact thing over and over again. And that for, I graduated when I was 17, which leads me to when I was 18. Um, you know, you don't you don't think you're going to end up in a small apartment um, wanting to kill yourself, you know. And, and some people never had that experience. I did. I was so miserable and so ate up and and just corroded from the inside out um, that I did. I wanted to kill myself. I couldn't figure out how not to drink. Uh, every time I drank <coughs> with anybody. Uh, it was this, this blackout experience, and, and I got told all these really embarrassing things the next day. I'd laugh about it and try to, it's funny, haha, ha, but it wasn't. I mean, I was really, it was, it was damaging. I was a really, I said I'd never hit a, a girl. I did, you know. Um, of course, that was my sister, and she hit back. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, not talking, I'm not talking about like a little pushing contest. It was like a, and I was in a blackout, but she told me later, I just, I, I laid into her like in like a closed fist, and uh, she grabbed the nearest thing, which happened to be one of those old school rotary telephones, and laid me out, and <laughs> drugged me by my feet out, and that, you know I was I mean it was that's kind of humiliating to come to outside of someone's door, you know, with your head all banged up, wondering what happened, and then hearing about it later because obviously I was raised better than that, you know I would never do that, you know I've, I've heard that before, I've, I've sponsored a lot of guys and. And that kind of stuff happens when you're a blackout drinker. You just don't really, you just don't really get it. So there were a lot of things I did that I said I would never do. I would never stoop to that level. I would never go there. So when I was ready to call Alcoholics Anonymous, um, it was no secret. A lot, of, a lot of my family members had been in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous, so I kind of knew that I didn't know anything about it, but I knew that there was an organization that, that helped people get sober. And uh, I was real embarrassed. I was humiliated. It was uh, oh God, it was Sunday night, and uh, I called the AA hotline, and this guy answered and, and uh, said, "I'm Mike Alvarez. I'm an alcoholic. How can I help you?" And that blew me away. You know, like how how somebody could say that over the phone, like that. I'm, I'm like kind of. I said, "Hey, I don't I don't know what to do. I'm I'm I don't." know exactly why I'm calling. Um, I had a blackout drunk the night before where I, I did a lot of, again, did a lot of damage and got some phone calls the next day. And he sent, it was a, it was a call service, but they would call another alcoholic to go meet you somewhere. And so they said, uh, all right, look, I'm going to have some, just sit tight, and, you know, ask me if I was okay. I said, yeah, you know, I, I, just, I just don't know what to do. And this guy called me, and we met at a coffee shop. And I showed up. Nobody was there, so I sat down in the, uh, the entrance to the, uh, the diner, I guess it was. And this guy walked in and looked like, uh, you know, looked like a professional. Had on a, had on a button-up shirt, a nice blazer, and he, uh, you know, he was well-dressed, shaved, everything. <coughs> had, a, had a book underneath his arm. And uh, as soon as he walked in, he, he did one of these looks around the room, and he, and he looked down, and he saw this me, you know. I don't know why he focused on me. I'm, I'm sitting there sweating, greasy. Um, you know, I was a little overweight. I had some nose ring, earrings. I had a lot of, lot, lot going on. You know, a really, really, really interesting picture. And I was scared to death. I was shaking. You know, I was scared to death. Um, and he zeroed in on me. He walked up and he said, "Hi, I'm Paul. You know, and you must be Justin." I said, "Yeah." yeah. So that was, you know, so we sat down, and he, this guy, told me a story. That night, he told me a story, and um, he didn't 
make me talk about everything. He, he asked me a couple questions, just real lightweight stuff, didn't, didn't scare him. But he told me a story. That's it. And, and he got sober when he was uh, 22, so I, I could relate to that. He'd been sober uh, 12 years, I think. And, uh, and it, it, it just blew me away, 12 years in a row, no drinking. Like, how, how do you do that? So he said, you know, he spent about two, three hours at that diner talking about things. You know, he asked me um, if I wanted to get sober. Was I, you know, was I willing to go to any lengths to get sober? Um, I, I said, yeah, because I didn't really, I didn't, you know, to me it was a, it's a bit of a blur. I don't know, it didn't dawn on me that, oh, oh my God, I've got this mental obsession coupled with a physical allergy. I've got to, I've got to handle it. I just didn't know where else to go. I, did, I couldn't handle it myself. Everything I thought to do, uh, swearing off, um, switching brands, it didn't matter what I drank. I, did, I didn't, I was like a gut. I didn't, it's like a garbage disposal. I didn't care what it was. I didn't have like a brand of whiskey and a 12 year old scotch that I drank. It was whatever was there. So him telling me his story and the fact that he was so young, was it really impressed me. He dropped me off and he said, hey, um, I'm going to a meeting tomorrow night. How about I pick you up? I said, yeah, okay, well, I'll be outside. And that started our um, sponsor, sponsee relationship. I asked him the next day when we were at the meeting. I went through a whole meeting. It was, it was midnight when he met me in that coffee shop. So he spent a good bit of time, obviously went to work full day the next day. I had to take off of uh, class because I, I couldn't focus on anything. So um, I met him that evening and we went out to my first meeting with Stag. And these guys were, you know, these guys were intimidating. It was a room full of, I mean, a lot of sobriety in that room. It was a big room, too. And I felt like I stuck out. I didn't know what to say. Um, but I heard, and I really, really in sobriety, I only heard maybe 5% of what was said in the meeting. Because the rest of the time, I was sitting there looking at the ground, thinking about other things, thinking about myself, like just like a, like a hamster on a wheel. And I'd just hear these little little bits and pieces. It wasn't like I'd come out of there going, that was a really good meeting. You know, I heard what Lonnie, I heard what Lonnie said. You know, when Lonnie shared, I heard this, this, and this. I never told my sponsor, Paul, I never told him that stuff. It was like, he'd asked me, you know, what, what'd you hear? But I did hear something that night. It was experience, strength, and hope. But it was kind of a, they tailored their, their speaking to the newcomers, you know, and, and there were a bunch of us that night in there. And they talked a lot about, um, they, they, a lot of drunk log and a lot of solution, a lot of action. And I could understand the action part, and that's, that's kind of what I, I hung on to. And they said, you know, guys pulled me off the side afterwards and said, hey, you know, you've been here before. Nope. You know, this is kind of how it works. You know, you, you come to meetings, you get a sponsor, you, you know, work the steps, and your life's going to get better. I said, yeah, okay. So I asked, I asked Paul to be my sponsor that night. We went to a meeting. I went to a meeting every night for uh, for just over four years, and it was it was nothing. He said ninety and ninety days, and that seemed like I remember thinking that was like this is a little much, right? You know, is that, don't you think that's a little much? He said, "Did you drink every day?" And I said, "Nope." <laughs> I was so I was so quick, you know. I said, "Nope, didn't drink every day." He said, "Well, when when you had alcohol, would you drink?" I said, "Oh, oh yeah." And and we, you know, he, by that time I told him I drunk a lot, but I see I was a smart ass, so I like to, you know, I like to kind of. I knew he was going to ask that, and I knew he was going to say, "Oh, you drink every day?" Of course I drink every day. Well, you go to a meeting every day. I'd already heard that, so I was, you know, I was a little bit combative. Plus, I was real angry and real afraid. And my my life was, and it didn't. It took me a while to realize this, but my life was ruled by fear, like a deep, <coughs> rotting fear of of everything of uh, getting up in front of a, a room full of people and speaking, looking somebody in the eye. Um, I'd stolen so much, and, and I'd been so dishonest with so many people that that's just well, who I was, you know, a liar, cheating a thief. And uh, it used to burn me up in, in meetings when I would hear that. <laughs> and the guys that I went to meetings with they would say it, but they'd look at me, and they, they, they talked to me when they were talking. I swear to God, they were talking to me. I knew it. And, uh, you know, of course, my self-centeredness, my selfishness. But I, I could have sworn they were talking to me every time they said that stuff. But all those one-liners, you know, they, 
I heard keep coming back so much in the first year. It made me sick. It was it was like, hey, keep coming back. Yeah, it's good to meet you. You know, you should keep coming back. Hey, keep coming back. Keep coming back. It's like, I got it. I'm here. You know, I, I just, just I was such a you know so combative. I'm so angry. It would just burn me up. But anger is that that fear. You know, I would get angry because I was scared. And um, the alternative, you know, I stuck around because the alternative was I, I knew I couldn't drink and I knew I couldn't figure it out myself. So I had to do I had to do something. And and Paul, thank God, you know, took this this time with me. He knew obviously he. He had been through the steps, and he had sponsored a lot of guys, and he knew the kind of person that I would be, you know, like the challenges, um, because I was challenging. You know, I didn't get here, and I was just so willing. I got here, and I was willing, but it was with, like, you know, a little bit of, I, I, had, to, I had to stick it to him a little bit. You know, I had to let, let him know that I wasn't just going to do everything. You know, I was going to be my own guy. You know, I was going to, like, figure some stuff out, like, it, but it was willing enough to do the next indicated thing. And, that, and thank God it was just enough. And he was so patient with me because I, I, really, I really was just a miserable prick uh, about everything. So when he would, he said, and it was no secret. You know, he's like, hey, this is no secret. This is, this is designed for living. We're going to get into the, uh, we're going to get into the steps. I said, I'm going to get you into the steps. We're going to read the big book. Um, I'm going to, you know, I want you to call me every day. Go to a meeting every day, and uh, and most of the time he went with me. He picked me up, take me to the meeting. You know, um, we started in on the steps, and it was again. It's it's like all I could do to to handle what I was hearing then. You know about alcoholism, and we t I told him my story. Um, I hi we highlighted the the lack of control, lack of power. Um, the fact that every time I, I drank, I just kind of lost control. I didn't have the ability to regulate. I wasn't a normal drinker. I just wasn't. It just wasn't in the cards for me. I don't genetics, whatever. It doesn't matter. It wasn't in the cards for me. And then um, talking about the physical allergy coupled with the mental obsession. You know, the fact that when I started, I didn't have any power over whether I was going to stop, whether I was just going to you know, put it down and walk away. I, I tried that. You know, I tried some controlled drinking. I really did. I wanted to be a fun guy. I just wasn't. I was like, you know, uh, does it? Yeah, that was it. So we, we, we got through that part, and I remember, I remember understanding about as much as I could then. And of course, everybody would always tell me more will be revealed. And that's another one liner I used to hate, 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 because it was like, man, I get it. No, I get it. No, I get it. I'm an alcoholic. I can't drink. I just worked the first step. I'm in the steps, you know. And they're like, yeah, keep coming back. More will be revealed. <laughs> I'm like, you know, well, you know, wait a minute. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm fast-tracking this thing. I'm good. You know, and we got to, um, you know, the, so the second, third step, the introduction of, of God, you know, um, reading Reading we agnostics, um, I was brought up in a church. I think it's immaterial. I mean, a lot of people get brought up in a church. It's neither here nor there. Uh, the church never saved me personally. It's my experience. Never saved me personally from uh, robbing from people, um, from doing things I said I would never do, from kind of stooping to the lowest form of, of humanity that I, I consider for me. Um, it just wasn't, that wasn't it. And, and God was a very foreign thing to me because, yeah, um, my best friend said he, he accepted Christ as Lord and Savior when we were kids, and he became a member of our church. And so I felt kind of left out, so I said I did. You know, I, I mean, that was just who I was. I wanted to be part of the deal. I mean, we were going every Sunday, so I might as well be the same status that he was. But I really didn't know anything about God, and, and it, it did make me bristle with antagonism. I didn't really think it did at the time. But, you know, going through that step, I kind of omitted the whole, I just, you know, I, I said I did, you know, and, and my sponsor told me that was okay. The, the, you fake it till you make it, you know. Um, you keep doing the actions. You keep doing what's, what's required. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do some things. You may not believe them wholeheartedly, but, but let's get through this, you know. And I didn't have a, 
a, a revelation. I didn't have an aha moment. I truly didn't. I just kept doing these things. I'd, I'd show up to a meeting early, make coffee. I would take out the trash. I would shake people's hands even though I didn't want to. Um, I would really try and look people in the eye. Um, you know, they had a couple meetings where they'd call on newcomers. I would, I would share as best I could. Um, those actions, you know, calling my sponsor every day, reading the big book, I'm truly reading the big book. I didn't retain any of it. I mean, I really didn't. I'd, I'd get through it, and I'd, I'd get like, again, maybe 5 or 10% of what was in there. And I really try and, and, and concentrate, but I was so, there's a lot of torque going on in my head. And still a lot of fear. And there's still a lot going on. You know, early sobriety for me sucked. You know, I really, I, I truly wasn't like a, it was not an experience I ever want to, you know, go through again. Um, but getting in that third step, we were in my sponsor's basement. And I, and I, you know, we went through the third step, got on our knees and said the third step prayer, holding hands. And I was, I was nervously looking out the window to make sure there's no one <laughs> looking in that could see us. Because, I mean... God forbid I'm trying to do something with my life, you know, like get on the right track, clean up my act a little bit, get sober, stay sober. Um, but that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an important guy. I'm real selfish that way, you know. So I was. I, I, was. I, didn't, I didn't get done with that prayer and stand up and go, oh, thank God. All right. Whoo. Obsession removed. I mean, yeah. I hadn't thought about drinking for, you know, for a while. It had been about a month maybe a little longer than a month, every meeting every day, doing these same things every day. But it's not like the last, you know, however many years we're going to iron out in about a month. You know what I mean? And there was a lot, of, there was a lot more to do. And he said, all right, into action. Here we go. Now we're getting into the meat of the program. These are the steps right here. We're going to make a personal inventory. All right? And we got in the fourth step. And, there, again, uh, the big book, what a, what a magical book. So simple. There are specific instructions in this book. It's a manual, uh, as way it was described to me, that tell you what to do. Um, to be truly honest with another human being, to lay everything out there. So we got into the, the four step and painstakingly wrote it out um, with all the guidance, with me asking a lot of questions, because I really did. I didn't want to fail. I wanted to succeed. You know, I want to make them know that I... And it was, it, was, it was more than just, you know, like a true understanding of what I was doing. It was more of I was doing what my sponsor told me. And that's, that's God's honest truth. At that time, it was what my sponsor told me. I trusted him implicitly, and we got in that fourth step. The following week, uh, we did the fifth step. I got done with that fifth step. I, I felt... It was it was one of the most draining experiences of my life because all that stuff that I had all the way down in my gut, everything that I'd, I'd hidden, everything that I wouldn't look people in the eyes over, everything that I'd done, it came out. It was just purged. I don't know any other word other than purge. It was just uh, the floodgates, you know. I mean, I it took hours. We, we sat there for hours, and I, I told them everything, <laughs> everything. It was... Like my anything, I, there's so much that I never wanted to tell another human being that I was so ashamed of. Uh, I told him everything, and we got done. I, I went home that night, and it was like the deepest sleep that I could remember having. Most nights, I would get to bed and just lay there, mind running, you know, self will run riot, torque, just thoughts going everywhere, you know, sitting on a bell tower somewhere. I mean, just it was just I was nuts all the time. I was just crazy. So we kept moving forward and I kept going to meetings. I kept working the steps. Service was a big thing with this guy. It was always an action. That's another thing about my sponsor, you know, and I, it's like I got to the, me being a smart ass, I got to the point where I'd call him up with a problem and I knew what he was going to tell me, <laughs> but I'd still call him and I'd still tell him. And I knew he was going to say, all right, let's get your big book. You got your big book? Yeah, I got my big book. All right, open it up to page uh, 64 and <laughs> start reading. I'm like, man, I, I, yeah, I just read 64. But I'm telling you, this is, this is what's going on. This is what happens. Like, all right, okay, here's what I want you to do. You going to meet tonight? Yeah, I'm going to meet tonight. You know I'm going to meet tonight. <laughs> yeah. All right, I want you to show up 30 minutes early, and you're going to meet so-and-so there. And you guys are going to make coffee, all right? And I want you to be the greeter. 
at the meetings. They were more, they were very structured. All these meetings I went to, a lot, they're all, LA is huge. South Bay, it's all these meetings all the time, all different meetings. Went to a men's stack every night except for Saturday when we went to a speaker meeting. That was a big deal. We go to a speaker meeting, go to dinner, go to a speaker meeting. Um, I didn't have a lot of money, so a lot of times, you know, uh, we go to dinner. I wouldn't get much, but it was it was good. Life was good. But those meetings were always structured. There's always stuff to do. There's so many people there. That was the right place at the right time for me and and who I was. I, I was so wrapped up in myself. You know, I had to do that all the time. You know, constant practice. Um, six, seven, uh, eight, nine. Talk about shortcomings. Um, Obviously, eight and nine, getting into, to me, getting into the amends, and that's where, that's where things really started to take off for me. Uh, coming up on six months, we started, it must have been about that time, we started the amends process, and I started, you know, I, I wrote my list, and it wasn't, I wrote a list, and that was it. I wrote a list, and I added a lot to it, a lot. Um, my initial list had, you know, just the ones off the top of my head, but there was a lot of stuff that I did when I was blacked out. There's a lot of stuff I did that I needed to ask my sponsor for guidance on. Like, you know, what was my part in this? I really, you know, I just couldn't see my part in everything. And so we, uh, we, we stayed real close on that. We made my list and I started making amends. Uh, I've heard different stories about people making amends. Uh, like family was the hardest thing for me, family. My family knew exactly who I was. Yeah, I, I hurt them bad, but they knew exactly who I was, and they were so happy that I wasn't drinking. The ones that were truly humiliating to me were the people that I didn't know very well, that I thought I was so worried about perfect strangers and their, their impression of me and who I was. Going to the, uh, the dean of a, of a college that I went to and making amends because I stole property from the college. Was was truly humiliating. I really, I was, I was shaking so bad. I had my hands in my pockets. Um, and the experience itself, once I got through, I stumbled through my amends. I had very specific guidance on how I was to make my amends. I'm so a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm, I'm here to make amends for a wrong, and I would lay out that wrong. Uh, I stole this, this, and this. And if I don't make amends to you, uh, then I could drink again and I, I can't do that so I'm here and I would I would talk to him and, and tell him my amends and I would come up with it, either have the money with me or come up with a payment plan which I had to do in several cases um, and in that particular case I don't know why that one scared me so much it was one of my first amends that's probably why um, after I was there he was a real nice guy he took time out of his in, entire day he's running a school to listen to me and uh, he said, you know, I'm glad you're here. He said, my father was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous for uh, 40 years, you know, and went on to tell me a little bit about his dad and what that, what that meant to him. And um, the feeling I got walking out of there, making that right, um, I, it's indescribable, the, the freedom that that starts to produce. And it, the more amends I made like that, the more free I felt. And I was able to start looking people in the eye, uh, and and not hanging my head every time. I like I'd sit there and talk and just mumble. And you know, of course, I had more hair, so it'd fall down on my face. And, you know, I would I'd just mumble. I wouldn't talk to people. You know, I, I couldn't look people in the eye. So, but that that freedom though of of making amends, making that making that wrong right, or at least cleaning up my side of the street. Um, that's where about halfway through, I really did start to experience the promises. And, and not all of them at once, not just a version of the promises where I actually felt at peace for, for periods of time where I wasn't constantly worried about myself all the time. I'd had periods where I felt okay. And, and I really started to chase that more and more in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I wanted that more than anything, just to feel that way most, most of the time. And... Um, Right away, you know, of course, we, we did that. I was getting through about half my men's. We started, you know, really getting into the, uh, the constant daily maintenance, uh, prayer meditation, waking up, getting right with God, getting off on the right foot, and uh, going about your day. And when you're wrong, admit it. 
clear up that wreckage on the spot and, and go about your life because for me, this is just for me, I'm, I'm the kind of person that if I, if, I, if I do something to another person, I can't sit on it. I get so uncomfortable and I, I feel so conflicted and messed up and I, I really can't, I, it's, it's, it's poison. I can feel it from the inside out. It's that poison. It's that fear. Um, so for me, those are critical. I have to do that stuff every every day. So for the last 17 years, that's what I've done. Not perfectly. I, I make a lot of mistakes. A lot of mistakes. And and I make far more amends than I think I should be doing at this point. You know, because I I have a temper, or I you know I, I I'm still very selfish. I'm still very. It's a process. Um, Big Book says this is a design for living. Um, and I'm going to touch back on the, the God thing. So that, that first year, it's not that I neatly avoided God, the concept of God, a God as I understand him. But I didn't fully understand how all this stuff tied together. And I'm going to read something that they put in We Agnostics. And I, I of course, read it so many times, but... Um, something that resonated with me a lot the, the longer I've been sober it just keeps, it keeps coming back up in my life. It says, well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself which will solve your problem. So, this entire process, this design for living, these steps, coming to meetings, being of service, sponsoring other guys, everything ties back to a relationship with God as I understand it. And this solves my problem. <laughs> Problems. Everything. The closer, the more of this that I do, and the closer I am to God. These are all tools. I'm, I'm, you know, I, it's, I'm a little slow. It takes me a while to figure this out. But these are all tools. Everything I've done in here, everything I continue to do in here is a tool to get me closer to God to chase that feeling of serenity and peace and, and not having those problems. So the problems I have now, um, I, was, I was telling <laughs> telling some people that some days, you know, long day at, at work, like I'm just crushing it at work, I'm tired, every joint hurts, my back hurts, uh, arthritis, all this other junk. And I'm standing at the door and I got, I'm like, man, I can hear on the other side of the door my, my beautiful family going nuts. Kids are running all over, daughter's crying, my son's got uh, a, a frying pan, he loves the cooking, you know, he's two and a half years old, so he loves to grab stuff <laughs> in the kitchen. He's, he's chasing somebody with it, I can hear it, on the other side of the door, and I'll just stand there on the side of the door going, oh, God, all right, here we go. Because I know when I walk through that door, they don't, they don't give a rat's ass if I had a long day. <laughs> it's, it's game on, and that's all the way till 8.30 when it's like, you know, bedtime but but here's the thing the only reason I have that family the only reason I have a job that I love the only reason that my kids look at me they've never seen me drink my wife's never seen me drink she knows enough about me to know that if I ever did start drinking I'd be I'd be like a total yeah she knows because we've got in arguments and the normal stuff and she's like man I would hate to see you drinking. I'm like, you don't. No, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad you feel that way. Just remember that on the night that I have to go to a meeting when, you know, you jump through your ass with the kids and I'm like, hey, I got to go. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's kind of a hard one to explain a lot of times. But, um, and, I'll, and I'll touch briefly on, on some of the promises in my life. And I, I feel, sometimes I feel like I lose a little bit of credibility with the young people because I'm 36 now. And, and I know that's young. I know that's young. But when you're talking to an 18-year-old, like, hey, I got sober when I was 18, you know? And they're like, yeah, all right. <laughs> sure. You know? And you're, like, trying to relate to them and stuff. I mean, yeah, it's like, a, it's like a, an asset. But then again, it's, it's been long enough to where it's, like, unbelievable. Because I didn't believe my sponsor. You know, I was like, you're, like, 30-something. And, and you said you got sober when you were 22. Yeah. How does that work? Um, so I understand. I do a lot of trepidation. Um, but some of the some of the some of the things I was worried about when I got first got sober. I remember thinking, and this is a real fear that I had, and I've shared this before. But 
I, I talked to my sponsor, and it was eating me up. And I said, hey, look, so I, so I want to be in the military someday. And I'm, I'm really worried that this, this AA thing is going to be like, you know, they're going to look at it in a negative light. And I'm just putting it out there. I'm really worried that that's going to, like, keep me from my dream job, <laughs> whatever that is. Well, it turns out, ironically, it turns out that being a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, a member in good standing of AA, is not necessarily a deficit, is, is more of an asset. It's more of a good thing. They don't look at that like in a bad way. If you, I mean, if you don't drink, you might be a little weird or whatever, but they're, they're not like, what a turd. <laughs> you know, you, you're out there paying your bills, you have a family, you know, you're actually doing good things, whatever, right? Turns out that that's not such a bad thing. And I, that's one of the things that really rotted my insides thinking about it was what was I going to do for work? Because <laughs> I was in AA. <laughs> so, yeah, just, just in case you're wondering, you know, in case you're young and you're worried about it like I was. Uh, so, you know, not all, not all experiences are, are equal, but I can tell you, f for me, everything that they said in the promises, and my sponsor told me this in the first year. He said, hey, look, please, yeah, by all means, dream. Like, think about all the things that you're going to have in life, whatever you, you know, promises, all these things. But, but understand that whatever you think right now, you're going to sell yourself way, way, way short. And I, that, that's been my experience. What I thought I needed in my first couple of years, several years, five years, whatever it was, everything I've done since then has blown that out of the water. Every experience I've had, and I've had some bad ones too. I had a period of sobriety where, where I, I truly felt lost. I lost a, a bunch of close friends of mine in, in a real short amount of time. I remember standing in, we just moved here to this side of town. I remember standing in the garage telling my wife, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if I can take another one of these, these losses. That was, I mean, it was like breaking my heart, literally. And, um, you know, as, as if by magic, I'm, I, I met, uh, you know, and I'd known, I've known this guy for a long time, but I met this guy uh, out in town, and he, I knew him. I knew he didn't drink. He shared his story. He said, hey, why don't you come to the meeting over here? And I came, I came here. It was like on a Friday night, I think. And uh, to get plugged back in at that point, and I, I've been sober for 15 years, to get plugged back in at that point was, was like, a, like a life raft after you've, after you've crashed. I mean, that's... The ups and downs. You know, you have a lot of ups and downs. I do, but but most of the time it's pretty level. You know, I deal with it. You know, God's helped me deal with those things, and, and I wasn't like that when I got here. But but that particular set of problems was was just crushing me. But here it is. Here's a solution. You know, I just moved. I felt a little disconnected. I was I was kind of I was kind of lost coming back to AA. You know. So if you're new, or if you're relatively new, and um, some of the problems are insurmountable, there is, in my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous, or someone who's been through almost anything, everything, in this room is sitting here sober. Um, we had a talk the other night with a kid that came in. Um, between the three guys sitting there, everyone had been through exactly what he was talking about, every situation. And I don't know if he believed this or not, we weren't selling anything. We were just talking to them, telling them our experience. But that's that is powerful, and it's it's not uh, you know it's not a one size fits all approach. It's just all right here. And in my experience, everything that I've done in Alcoholics Anonymous has led me to this moment and the life that I have now. So thanks for letting me share.